counted such a blessing to be able to share God's Word whenever I have the opportunity. But, you know, it, it's been over 40 years since I've known Jesus. So when I hear things like that, I get embarrassed. My, I don't know if my face is red. But, I mean, all that is so foreign to me now. I don't, you know, having been a drug addict and having... I was an alcoholic at 12. You heard that last year. And so prior to coming to Christ, my life was ruined. And now that I got 40 years of, of desiring with all my inner being to want to love Jesus, all that is just foreign. I mean, for many, 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 many years, I, I've been privileged to tell people the good news and to share with those that were in the state I was in prior to me coming to Christ. And the ones that many have received, some have not. But ironically enough, I'm dealing with a situation now. I have a younger brother that's in that same boat today. And I cannot tell you how many times I have shared with him as simply and as concisely as I could the simple message of the gospel. I flew down some months ago to Michael's state of Miami, or Florida, and prayed with my brother. You know, but there was... I don't know if God wrote his name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He was in the hospital and he, he just was wanted something to grab onto. So he's in harm's way, eternally, I think, and I surely know medically. So his name is Timmy. Keep him in prayer. And I might be flying back to Miami when I, get, when I leave here on Friday. I don't know yet. But the simple truth to God's Word is life-changing. And we've made it so complicated. We have... We've added all this peripheral stuff to it that it gets lost. It, it gets confusing. It gets very complicated. And I didn't get a chance to tell Renee this, but when, when I got the email and, and he said, would you, would you share the message? I went, oh, what? You don't even have to ask. I get very excited about being able to tell the good news that's happened to my life. So the funny thing happened. I'm going to be reading out of John and Renee when he asked me to talk with the IT people about what scriptures, I have three pages of scriptures. I, I, I've since decided not to read them all, but, but, I, but I said, Lord, what would you have me to share? I mean, I've read the Bible many times. I know, I, just to tell you a little bit about how goofy I am, when I'm on a plane, I fly, I do 170,000 miles a year, so I'm in an airplane quite often. And when I grew up as an ignorant Catholic, now if you're Catholic or came from the Catholic background, don't be offended by that. But I didn't know anything about the Bible. I had no clue how many books, who wrote it, what they were saying, why it was said, the history of all of the books. So I just started reading. And Michael and I were sharing this past morning about, I believe, I'm not a very smart guy, but I'm not ignorant either. But I believe that all of my understanding of life now now, I told you a little bit about where I was prior to Jesus, but let me tell you a little bit about why I, I believe God picked John 14, 6 today. Michael and I were in the same business together. He had one hotel, and I had a hotel, and we leased the beach area, and we rented sailboats to the patrons of the hotel. One of the finest jobs I ever had in my life. Ours was a family business as well as his. But every single morning for four years, I went to a coffee shop to have breakfast. I haven't made a cup of coffee in my home ever. So I would go to the coffee shop. They had a nice little breakfast, 5.30 is when he opened. I didn't have to put the sales up in the business until the sun came up. And that was usually about 7 o'clock, 7.30, maybe 8 o'clock. And that's when the patrons from the hotel would come out and they would rent the sailboats and go about the day. But every single morning, seven days a week, I spent reading God's Word. Now, there's no halo. <laughs> you know, that becomes a noose. But it was, it was such a life-changing, thank you, transformation of an ignorant, lost, despicable human being to somebody who now... I will hold myself up to anybody. Not that what I have done, but what Christ has done in me. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a thief. I'm not a liar. I'm not a cheat. Although those things are out there if you want them. You can go get them if you want them. 
And I think that's what John 14, 6 is trying to convey to us today. But before I get into the scriptures, I want to tell you a kind of a funny story for me. I love preaching more than I, can't say as much as my wife, but close to my wife. I love sharing God's word. And I got a bride of 37 years. I love her to death. But this is so exciting to me because I can be able, as a, as a nobody, not like the big shots here, but as a nobody, I can share God's word and he's made a promise on it never to have it come back void. To me, that's the greatest win-win situation on the planet. You don't have to be anybody, and if you're somebody, God bless you. But if you're a nobody like me, you share God's word, and I'm going to kind of be ugly towards American church in a minute, but give me a little grace here. What we do in the American church is we storytell, and that's not a bad thing if you come back around to the Word of God as a basis by which the, pay, or the, the people of the church leave the church. But if they've left the church with your story, they've gained nothing. And I'm not, I'm not picking on them. I know some really good pastors, big churches, they have all the things that the church offers. But if you want life, and you want it to grow in you and to produce something in your character, in your being, in who you are day to day. Because you know and I know. We all lay our heads on the pillow at nighttime, right? So that 24-hour day that you lived, you know whether or not you thought bad thoughts, did bad things, said bad words, or you lived on the other side. You did good things, you said good things, you lived good in your heart, in your character. You know. I can't tell you whether you did or didn't. I just know from my own life that the Word of God in me now convicts me when I'm outside His will. He encourages me when I'm in His will. So John 14, 6, I'm sleeping one night. Renee gave, sent the email. I'm very excited about it. I'm, I said, Lord, I'm going to fast and pray. You know, you heard last year, I fast a lot. Probably don't take off much weight, but I fast a lot. And I'm going, Lord, what would you have me to share? I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on planes. I read the word. I read, I learned it like, go eat popcorn. Anybody know what that's an acronym for? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. I was so stupid. I didn't know I had to put an acronym together to understand where God's word was. So I spend a lot of time reading those four books because they're little. You can, get, you can gleam real truth out of them in a, you know, a one-hour flight, two-hour flight, three-hour flight. And I do it all the time. Now, probably to the neglect of some of the other books, but I know them by heart. I can't quote them, but I know them by heart. So I'm thinking, well, that's the direction that God wants me to go. Well, John 14, 6 comes along. This is the true story. I, w I, I wake up remembering a dream. I had just preached John 14, 6. And I only wished I had taped it. It was that good. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. I wished I could have had the... It was in a dream. And I woke up excited. I jumped out of bed before the alarm got off. And I'm thinking, how can I write all this stuff down? Well, the funny part about it is I wrote all that down that I thought that I could remember that God had told me to share. And I went and researched the scriptures and put a little theme together and whatnot. And I lost it on a plane. <laughs> I left it in the back of the seat. I never do that. I've, I've been on more planes than you probably have toes and fingers. And I never lost it. And I got to my next destination and I got, where's my notes? So I've rewritten it and hopefully God's still in it. But here's why I picked it. Let me kind of, I'm old, i got to get glasses. But I, I think not so much this church, and I do have to encourage the leadership here, is I come here to get blessed. I mean, I like blessing the people of China. We're hard workers. We are getting a little older, Michael. So we're doing as best I am, but he's not. We're, we're getting as, you know, we're getting up there in age, so carrying, you know, a lot of bread is still tough for an old man like me. But I love it. I want to bless the people of China. I want the Word of God to go in because it has a promise of life to all that read it. So I'll do it until the Lord says don't do it anymore. So m my point to this was 
The Word of God is just that. I could get clever, I could put a message together, but I'm seeing that the, the church as a whole has gotten away from the Word. And I, I wanted to say a minute ago, that's why I get so encouraged here. I see these people and I know these people and we communicate by email. I get refreshed when I'm here. I'm in a church of four or 5,000 and you're just a person. Here you're part of a body. So take that to heart. Take that from somebody that we have more resources than you can imagine. We take in $11 million a year. That's a lot of money. U.S. dollars. What would it be in, you know, that would be a lot of money in Hong Kong dollars. So we have the resources, but we don't have this camaraderie of love and desire and compassion for one another that I sense here every single time I come. So my compliments to you if that's the right way to say it and I encourage you to continue it because everybody that walks in that door and I'm one of them I feel it so you got a great thing here so I'm excited for you okay John 14 6 you, you probably know the verse so this isn't going to be revelation although it will be truth and I know you've probably heard it from the pastors as they've shared over these many years but I want to kind of break down what Jesus said and why he said what he said in John chapter 14 just one verse there for a minute. But chapter 13, if you remember, what was chapter 13 all about? It was about servanthood. It was the chapter where he did what to his apostles? Wash their feet. Okay, now, I'm going to ask a kind of a personal question. So if you haven't, don't get offended. Who's washed someone's feet here? Okay, I have. <laughs> I remember being at a, in an early church where we used to meet, and we had a whole bunch of nuns come. And it was really, really cool to see them. They got all born again, and they were really on fire for Jesus. But we went to wash their feet, and they all had hose on. <laughs> so they all had to take their hose off up on the, on the altar, and it was just funny to me. But the feet, there's, if you know of this time in history, the feet were, were very dirty. I mean, they walked in cow dung and... and horse dung and all the nonsense that was on the ground. It was on their feet. That's why they wanted them to wash them when they came in their house. But Jesus, the maker of heaven and earth, washed. Think about it for a minute. I don't know how you perceive the Jesus you serve, but it was God incarnate that stepped into space and time to reveal who He is to us. And He was willing to stoop to that level to wash the disciples' feet. And to me, that's, that's why I don't, I don't understand prejudice at all. I understand it outside Christ, but I cannot understand it. it I can't even comprehend how anybody in the body could be prejudiced. Because we were all spitting in God's face, as Romans says, before, and He still loved us, but before we came to Christ. So now, the, if the maker who we served washed his disciples' feet, what are we to do? We're to wash their feet. However that's implied, whether it's literal or spiritual, meaning you serve them, you care for them, you give them time, money, energy, whatever it is to care for somebody. So let me go back to 14.6 now. He says, I am the way... Let me read it real quick. You can see i got more tabs. But John 14, 6 says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. A couple things I, want to em I really want to emphasize there is you've got a lot of religions out there. And, and I know the enemy is masterful at confusing the world and sometimes believers about, well, what is truth, what isn't truth, are we the only way or whatever. The one that rose from the dead made the statement. I didn't make it. So when people yell at me about the, the truths of the Scriptures, hey, take it up with God. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through Him. So that's a foundational truth to what we believe. It doesn't matter who you're talking to, where they come from, whether it's the Muslim world or whether it's the, the Hindu world or, or the Shinto of Japan. It doesn't matter. Their way won't lead to life. I know it sounds very narrow, very unchristian, but it is the greatest gift ever given 
because we'll get to the way part in a minute, but the greatest gift ever given was himself to make the way. If you, if you compare it, if you did a side-by-side -side comparison, you will find that nobody else offers a way. They'll tell you there's a way, but he offered a way by the dying on the cross and the raising from the dead. If he just died on a cross, there would be no entrance to heaven. But he died and rose where his blood covered all of us and all of mankind. So we now, as Hebrews says, we can come boldly under the throne of grace. That, to me, that's exciting. To me, that emphasizes who he is, what he did, and who we are, and how we can enter into what he did for us. Okay. The way. Now, think about the way for a minute. You know, you've read the verse probably more times than you can remember. But the way, it's a direction to a person. It's, it, is a, it is a direction. It's going, if, uh, if we're going to go north, well, then we're going to go this way. I guess that's north. I'm in a room, so that, that's east, that's west, that's south. I'm north would probably be behind us, if I'm correct. But you know that the sun comes up in the east and goes down in the, in the west. So the, if we want to go north, that's a direction. But it's not, the, what he's implying here is it's not just a direction. It's to a person. And when you think about what the way is, you ask yourself, well, how does the way apply to me? What, what does the way mean to me? Okay, he did make the statement that, well, let me, give, let me read Hebrews chapter 10 real quick. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 24, it says, Having therefore, brothers, boldness to enter into the holiness by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. God used the death of Christ by the means to pay to get us into heaven. And having a high priest, who he was, he represented the Old Testament at that time as the high priest. Having a high priest over the house of God, He's, he's making a statement, if, if Paul's the writer in Hebrews, he's making a statement to us, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed by the pure water. Let us hold fast our profession and our faith without wavering. God, understand what I mean here, God has no control over your wavering. Now, He ultimately does, but we, we choose to waver or not. Of all of the promises there, we choose to either believe that promise or we don't believe that promise. And when you don't stand upon the word as the basis for your life, what happens? You do this. Sometimes sure, sometimes not. One of the things that's probably, the, in my opinion, one of the most confusing things that we either believe God for or don't believe God for is healing. I've had two liver transplants. And I can tell you, they've not been fun. The first one was kind of a piece of cake. The second one was a nightmare. Health-wise, meaning I didn't recuperate as quickly. It, it wasn't fun, but I've told Renee and Michael and several others over the past several years that I, I, if, I, if it was me to choose it this way, to tell the gospel, I'd have done it in another way. But I know the opportunities that God has used in my sickness. Now, think about it for a minute. My sickness came from... 55 years earlier, or 52 years earlier, of living in sin and shame, and the results came 40 years later, or 30-something years later. It's, and I thought, well, God, you healed me. He said, all things work together for good, and that's what I have to stand on. I can think through and reason through and argue with all day long, but that's the wavering part. Let not your faith waver. Stand upon the Word of God when you don't understand it. There's some things that are very clear. Immorality. I've been married to the same bride 37 years. Can I go cheat on my wife? Absolutely. There's plenty of women that will give them, well, not maybe less today, but there's a lot of them out there that will give you. <laughs> but my point to that is it's there if you want it. If I, I was on a cruise with my bride several months back, and I haven't drank in 40 years. 
And I cannot tell you how many times the enemy brought to my attention, well, nobody will know if you're out here. You're 7,000 miles away from your home church. Yeah, go ahead and have a drink. Thinking to myself, where in the world did that come from? <laughs> Haven't had it in 40 years. But the enemy is relentless. He's going to do everything he can to keep you and I from maturing and growing in the things of God. I didn't succumb. I didn't drink. I don't want to drink. I know for me now, this is no halo here again, I know what will keep me in trouble and what will not keep me in trouble. I'm that smart. Not only that smart. So if I know what, how to stay out of harm's way and what not to do, I'm going to do it with his strength. But back to my illness, God told me that he said, son, he didn't say he wasn't going to heal me. And he didn't say he was going to heal me. I've been through all the scriptures. I know it. I've taught it. We lived under men that said, if you confessed otherwise, you were sinning. I set all that aside. And God said, believe me for the word's sake. All things work together for good to those that love me and are called according to his purpose. Now, I can't tell you how many people, professionals, doctors, anesthesiologists, nurses, nurse practitioners, and that I've had the privilege of planting the seed of, of hope in their hearts, some we've prayed with, because of that sickness. Now, would I have wanted done that way? Absolutely not. But I know that's the way God chose to do it. And I'm not going to fight him on it. I'm going to say, Lord, please bring me through it. Give me strength. Give me health. Continue to restore my body and my health each and every day. The medical community is amazed how well I've done under the circumstances. I would be here for a day telling you all the particulars. We don't have time. But that in itself, they keep asking me one question. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and I took that as a compliment, funny enough. What's wrong with you? It, it's Jesus in me. And, you know, the ones that didn't want to hear it cuff their ears, the ones that go, really? And it just, those are the planting times. Those are the seed times. Okay, so, there's two ways to travel in this life. I'm going to move along quickly. There's, Jesus says in Matthew that there's a broad way, right? There's a giant way. And there's a narrow way. I don't know about you. I've been on the broad way. And... The funny part about the enemy, and tell me when I'm getting close to time, I don't know when we've got to cease, but the, the, the broad way will make you happy for this amount of time. That's all. Don't, don't let anybody tell you, oh, sin doesn't make you happy. It's a lie. It'll make you happy. But you'll need more and 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 more to stay happy. But if you want, and, and I don't even need to go through all of the sin that's on the broad road, do I? Everybody know it's out there. So my question to you is, what road are you on? Now, you come to church, and I'm not picking on you now. If you come to church, God bless you. But you're only here out of 168 hours. You're only in church three hours. That's 12 hours uh, a week or a month. Give an hour or two hours on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, that's another uh, 248. So you're talking 28 hours, or if you go a long time, out of 168 hours, take half of that for, for sleeping. So what kind of road are you walking on when you're not with your pastors and your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? And, that, and I'm asking that of myself every day, and I'm telling you categorically, I make myself conscious of every footstep now. I'm, I'll be 60 this, this December. And not that I didn't make it myself, or I didn't, good English, not that I didn't make myself more conscious today, but I'm getting closer to eternity. <laughs> I'm going to step into there one day. Now, I'm assuming I'm going to live, I think God told me when I first got saved, when I'm going to go to be with Jesus. So I got 17 years, and I know I'm going to go into eternity. If it holds true, you know, charismatic movement got a little nuts at times, but I think that's what God spoke to me. But here's my point. I'm taking, I'm taking cognizance of every step of the road I'm on because you've heard me say it, and I promise you, if you don't have this vision for your life, it's going to be tough. If you don't get a well-done, good and faithful servant when you step into eternity, this will mean nothing. 
I promise you, I have more money than I can shake a stick at. I have a good job. I got a beautiful wife, three kids. You've heard the story before. But none of that's going to be remembered when the King of Kings says, I never knew you. So back to the, to the road. The wide road we know leads to destruction. That's what Jesus told us. And the narrow road leads to what? Leads to life. Not just eternal life, but life here. I have a peace I've never had before. It, I'm going to say it so I don't get in trouble. No, I hope I don't get in trouble. Hell could freeze over tomorrow. I said hell in church. Hell could freeze over and I don't get miffed anymore. You know, the, the sky could fall or the issues of life could, you know, come up around my neck and it's like, yeah, I don't like them. I'm not real happy with them and I got to deal with them. But I'm not falling apart anymore because I know the one who is life. And he put me on a way, as he did you, he put us on a way to walk, bless you, closer and closer and closer with him every day. See, this is, and I don't know how you got saved, but when I got saved, it was radical. From really bad to really good. <laughs> like that. No more drugs, no more alcohol, no more cigarettes. Those are usually the things they tell you you've got to give up. No more bad sex, no more living like the devil, no more stealing, no more cheating, no more lying, getting my, my mind situated on the things of God from point A instantaneously. I don't know why it doesn't happen that way for everybody. But I know now I owe more <laughs> because to whom much is given, much is required. I know I owe God every breath. And when I pray, when I get on my knees in the morning and end it at night, it's, Lord, let the breaths that I breathe throughout my 24-hour day be to your glory and to your honor. Now, don't look at me like, oh, you know, he's such a holy man. I still, I still, I still fight the same battles. I still fight lust. I still fight uh, dishonesty. I still fight, um, as I told you, the opportunity to drink. I, I run a, a $50 million company. I don't own it. I wish I did. But I mean, I'm out with people all the time. Go to church every Sunday, and I'm out with them five days a week, and they're immoral. I don't want that for my life. I want a well-done, good and faithful servant. And I hope that's what you want for your life. I know that's what the pastors want for your life. I know that because, I don't mean this, and I hope they don't get mad at me, the, the bigger responsibility now falls on them. Because they have to be the example to you, for you to look to them, that they can say, I want this of people, of me. And I want to be like him. I, I, I want it. I don't want, I'm not going to shy away from it. Because as I told you, I'm not out doing it. I told my kids, every Sunday or Monday when I go to work, and when I teach Sunday school, Sunday morning, I'm the same dad. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and when I come back Sunday, I'm the same dad. So you have to ask yourselves, does that repetition hold true of you? It holds true of me, and you can ask my colleagues and friends, they think I'm the wackiest dude they've ever met. Which is okay, I don't have to answer to anybody but the King of Kings, right? And my wife. Okay, so I won't read it to you, but uh, Peter makes the statement in Acts chapter 2, he says, save yourself from this untoward generation. What the world doesn't understand is this generation's going this way to a cliff. And Peter says, save yourself. How do, we, how do we save ourselves? We save ourselves by giving ourselves to Christ that He can mold and shape and rearrange us. Obviously starts with salvation, confessing with your mouth. We'll go through this at the end of the service. Believing in your heart that He raised from the dead, repenting of your sins, and He gives you eternal life. The Bible defines it as writing your name in the Lamb's book of life. But Peter says, this generation, and I think all generations he's implied, is, go is, is going towards destruction. But he tells the people that receive Christ, save yourself from that generation. Save yourself from that destruction. Okay, then he goes on to say, wide is the gate, obviously leads to destruction. Narrow gate leads to life. But it talks about in Acts chapter 4, that they notice something about the believers. And again, I can't read all these scriptures because Renee gave me a funny look. But the, and if you read chapter or the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, they, the people that were questioning the believers, they said something about them that is 
always stayed with me. Remember, I said I wasn't very bright, but I can read. They noticed something in those believers that said they had been with Jesus. And it, oh, and that, they literally were with Jesus. But I believe the spiritual implication is when your friends and colleagues and co-workers and people that you interact with, because you live in a world I don't live in. I live in a world you don't live in. But all the people in the world we live in, when they see you, what do they see? Do they see Jesus? Because the early church was a representation of who Christ was, of the risen Christ. They, they made the statement here, God intended it to be in God's Word. They had been with Jesus. So how do you be with Jesus? It's right here. <laughs> if you're not in this headlong, if you're not... I'm not saying nobody does it, and if you tell me you do, I'm going to know you're fudging a tad. You know what that term is, fudging a tad, a little bit. You're lying a little bit. Nobody goes, spends hours and hours and hours reading the Word. There's very few of us. But if you get a good habit of a little bit a day, every other day, whatever you see God speaks to you, but something's going to influence you. That's who, how we're wired. Something will guide you, something will lead you, something will direct you. Whether good, whether bad. But the more you stay in this, the more this has the chance to filter through your heart and mind and spirit, you will be like Jesus. Now, let me define that for a minute. And I'm going to say something, and I hope I don't be asked to leave or never come back. But I'm not a sinner. God's Word says I'm not a sinner. I'm a saved saint in God's... I'll show it to you in Ephesians. We have now been positioned in the heavenlies with Christ. Sin cannot be present in God's presence. It can't be. So God doesn't see me as a sinner. He sees me washed by the blood of His Son. Now, let's get literal. Okay, that's temporal. Let's get now. I mean, that's eternal. Let's get temporal. Am I going to sin? I'm trying not to. Do I fall? Absolutely. Pray for me. <laughs> Pray that God gives me strength not to. But He doesn't see us as sinners. So when you don't see yourself as a sinner and you see yourself as a child of God, you will rise to another level of a walk of faith. You will see yourself strong and, and vibrant in, in the things of God. I promise you, you're, you're looking at somebody that is there. It's taken me a long time to get there, but I'm telling you, I'm striving and looking and praying and fasting and wanting the things of God in my life on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why I know the things that were so easily done 40 years ago, I haven't even thought about many of those in 40 years. Michael told the tale that Renee shared this morning about dying in the Jackson Hospital where Michael works. I didn't even remember it. It was that far ago. So the cool part about who we are in Christ is forget what the world sees you at. Now if you're living in sin, they have a right to challenge you. But if you're living a holy and righteous life, God sees you as a child of God. And I don't know, I have children and I promise you they're the best thing on the planet. I would fight for them, I would, I, would, I would storm the gates of hell for them. Whatever I had to do to make them prosper and grow and be in whatever good, good standing, good health, whatever. And I think God does that for His children every, every single day. But I think what happens is the, the, obe the disobedient factor is what keeps us from growing. But that's a personal choice. Okay. Jesus said He is the way. So if He says He is the way, how do I get on His way? Well, pretty simple. Romans, I'll get to Romans 12, 1 in a minute. But in, in the Gospel narrative, Jesus said that you receive eternal life by receiving Him as your Savior. So very simply, you, you become a Christian, you get on the way. Now, again, back to the way. The broad and narrow, or the broad or the narrow way. You choose as you go through time. But if you want to stay on the way, Romans chapter 10, uh, Romans 10, uh, 9 and 10, very, very evangelical verses. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, 
uh, you would be saved. And then he goes on to explain, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Those are the gospel important building blocks for you and I to come to salvation. So, the, so he talks about in Acts chapter 9, the people of the way. There was a distinguishing difference between the pe how the people lived in the second chapter, or in Acts, the time of Acts, than the people of the world. So you get in the way or get on the way through Jesus, but to stay on the way is something you and I do. Now, obviously with God's help, I'm not, this isn't a, 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 a um, psychology, you know, philosophy idea here. This is, he gives you the strength to hold his hand as you walk the way. That's what it's all about, is leaning on him to be able to stay on that way, because Jesus is the way. We're getting to know him and, and emulate and be like him in our character and our behavior and the way we think and act and behave, so that we're walking a way that is pleasing to the Father. Okay, how do I stay on the way? Romans 10, 9, 10, uh, 10, 9 and 10, as I just read. And then uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, which to me is a, is a tremendous key verse on who we are as people of God. Verses, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Obviously, Paul says, No, sir. Know ye not that, verse 3, that so many of us were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him in baptism, and like as Christ was raised from the dead, so we are raised to the newness of life. So everybody that's born again is on the way, on the new way, the narrow way. Whether we choose to stay on it or not is something you and I decide as time goes by. But then also, Galatians chapter 5. But look, I want to read verse 13 real quick before I move on of chapter 6. He says, if you look at chapter 6, and to me this has always been a key element in God's part and our part. And what is your part in the walk of faith? Now God gave you the faith, it's ironic, He gave you the faith to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So He even said that it's He that works in us both the will and to do of His great pleasure. So that's all God working in you, but there is a responsibility on our part. And Paul defines it for us here right now in verse chapter 6, or verse 13 of chapter 6. Verse, let me go with 12. Uh, start with 11. Uh, <laughs> Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus our Lord. That's the, that's the starting point. It says, let not sin reign in your mortal body. The, the, the Greek there, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have read it, it says, you let not sin reign in your mortal body. It's not that God, He doesn't want it in your mortal body, but you make the choice to not let it in your body on a day-to-day -day basis. Now he goes on to say that you should not obey the lust thereof. That's the broad road. That's lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, John says. Those are the things that just are on that, that wide road every single day. You rein those little suckers in. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them, let them get smaller, 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 smaller. You need them, but they're not to dominate you. The lust of the eye. You're going to see pretty things. I was amazed by how beautiful these women up here today singing. Man, they're gorgeous. But you rein in what your mind will think versus what your eyes see. You leave the lust part alone and you say, Lord, thank you for beautiful women. But in the flesh, what would you do? <laughs> you know what you would do. So you rein in those little guys. So back to verse 13, he says, Neither yield you, you and me, neither yield your members as instruments to unrighteousness unto sin, but, the flip side, yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members, what are your members? Your hands, your feet, your mind. Don't let, he goes on to say, he says, your members, and again, hand, feet, eyes, mind, so forth, as members of instruments of righteousness. He says, don't use your, your hands and feet and mind as instruments of unrighteousness, but choose to use them for righteousness. Michael and I were talking on the way in. I think we have a misunderstanding about freedom. We are free. I am free from sin and shame. But sin and shame is all around me. 
It's there. It's nipping at my heels, as Hebrew says. Those unrelenting sins, they're always there. So it, freedom is the freedom to choose not to. It's not, to. it's not the freedom to choose, but it's the freedom to choose not to. Because before you and I were in, in Christ, let me use my own life so I won't, get, won't offend anybody. Did I have any choice in my drug addiction once I was in it? No. The drugs had me. When I was an alcoholic at 12 years old. So at that young age, when I was in the, all that alcohol, did I have any choice? No, it had me bound up. It told me what to do and when to do it. So the freedom that I got in Christ that set me free from all that now gives me the freedom to stay away from it. But it's never left. Meaning it's, it's there if I want it. I don't want it. So, back to the, the, my point earlier. Jesus is the way. The way is very simple. If you're in Christ, you're on the way. But you have to, when you're laying in bed at night on that pillow, how did I live on the way? Did I live on the broad and wide to destruction way? Or did I live on the narrow way? You got to do it 24-7, every day of your life. Because I've been complacent. I know you'll just drift. I'm not an airline pilot. But do you know that just two degrees, I heard this from a pilot, if, if you're off by two degrees on your destination, in a matter of hours, you're several hundred miles away. <laughs> it's always made an impact on me that I don't even want to be off the smallest degree when it comes to walking in the things of God. Because it, what happens is the, the more you let that sin in, the more you let that little, oh, it's a nothing, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And Hebrews says what's happening. Anybody ever had a cut here? Okay, what happens at the end of a cut? That area heals over and usually it ends up a scar. And then what happens on a scar is the scar area is dead. Well, that can happen to your spirit. The more you let sin and shame in a specific area, you will die. That area will die to your conscience. And you'll just say, yeah, it doesn't matter. But that's the, that's the little road. You get off, 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 and now you're several hundred miles away. I know, I've seen it on TV. I'm, I'm going to say this, but understand what I mean. I've, I've heard preachers say, well, God told me to, to divorce my wife and marry that girl. Do you understand how stupid it is? God will not, cannot, and does not go against His Word. I don't care what you think, what you feel, what, you know, you're in the Spirit. I can tell you what spirit you're in if you're, if you're against God's Word. I mean, if what you do, what you say, how you behave is contrary to this, this is always true, and you're out to lunch. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the way. Now let's talk about truth. This one we could spend an eternity on. Because if you listen to or watch TV, which... I find myself, and I know you're going to horse laugh me here, but uh, the guy that had his wife turned to salt, Lot. Lot was grieved by his generation. I'm telling you right now, when I watch TV, I don't know about you, and I'm going to say something, I, my face will probably turn red, but when Victoria's Secret ads come on, I turn them off. Because when I was young, if you showed a bra strap on TV, all hell broke loose. They got letters to the FCC, they wanted censorship to the advertisers and whatnot, and now they got ladies, very pretty ladies, on stage flaunting almost naked. They make Playboy, if you know what that magazine is, probably every guy on the planet's ever looked at one. They make that magazine look like it's a school magazine. They've gone, they've pushed the envelope to the nth degree. So here's my point to all that. The truth that you want in your life better not come from the world. Because the world has no truth in it apart from God's truth. Because we're going to get to the enemy in one, one quick second. I've probably got about 10 more minutes, I think. But the enemies come to do three things. Who, who can quote them? Okay, what? Kill, steal, and destroy. So, do you think he's going to preach holiness and righteousness in his form of truth? Come on. No, he's not. So, and I don't mean this ugly, but I'm seeing these kinds of truth enter into the church today. We got it in the, 
and I'm picking on the American church here, we got it in the, I'm trying to remember what, what message they called it, but it's kind of like a, you know, an all-inclusive will. God wants everybody to come in. He does want everybody to come in, but He doesn't want you to come as you are. He does want you to come as you are. He doesn't want you to stay in that position. He wants you to come, give your life to Christ. I know people, and I'm not picking on them, so please cut me a little slack. I know people that, that are immoral five days a week and teach Sunday school every Sunday and sit in the pew. And my, my question to them is, if you're going to a church where the Spirit of God is not convicting the hearts of the people who are living in sin, I would run from that church. I don't believe I would find it here. If these guys knew that your life was out of order, I believe they'd go right to you. And they would say, pretty lady, <laughs> get your act together. What can I help you? What can I do? What, how can I be the kind of pastor you want to see you walk it out? Because I'm walking it out. But in America, we don't... And I'm not picking on all churches because I go to a pretty good one. But the message that you see on TV, the all-inclusive, God wants you happy, God wants you wealthy, God wants you this. There's only one thing in the Scripture that God wants from your life. Anybody want to shout it out? God wants you holy. He wants you set apart for the master's use. And holiness, we could, I know Renee could teach circles around me, but we could spend weeks talking about the holiness of God. We are so deceived to think that we can take the ways of the world that's being forced down our throats and take it to church and make it work. I'm telling you today, good church, it's not God's plan. God's plan for us as a body is to come out from among them to be living lights of the peace, the joy, the happiness that the world doesn't have. They're to say of, us, of all of us, what is it about you? What's the matter with you? Why is your life when, there, when it's chaos in the world and yet you have peace, you have joy, you have hope? Because I'm telling you, this generation has no hope. I have three children that were raised in a godly home and I can see in them that when they talk, I'm constantly encouraging them, stay in the Word, stay in the Word. They're all professionals, doctors and so forth. And, but the world's bombarding them about the thought process. Again, back to this. If this isn't rearranging your thought process in your mind and your character, which is all filtered down, is that when you get it in your mind, you'll get it in your heart and it'll eventually change your character. That's what the Word of God is all about. I know it was quoted earlier about John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was God. That's the cool part about who He is. It's not that He's just a... I don't know, even know what analogy I could give. But He's not like the rest of them. He was God in the beginning, stepped into space and time to give you and I life. I don't know about you, but I owe Him everything. Because I know how bad I was. I am the way, I am the truth. John 1.14. The truth he talked about there was full of grace and, tr grace and truth. Grace, the unmerited favor of God. God didn't owe us anything. But we owe Him everything. If you think about, and I said it earlier kind of kiddingly, but I know I owe, more God, I owe more to God than you do based on how bad I was. And I want to repay him as much as I can on a day-to-day -day basis so that he will say, well done, good and faithful truth, or good and faithful servant. But if I don't allow his truths, his, his mandates, his directives, his important statements to life and character to be filtering through me, to change me, and to rearrange my character, it won't happen. I'll just be okay. I'll just get to heaven. I don't want to just get to heaven. Paul says, or if he's the writer of Hebrews, there'll be some that get in as by fire. I've been trying to write a book for a lot of years, but it's called Based on the Bowl. Everything you and I do is going to go in a bowl. I don't know if you knew that. Everything you said, everything you did, everything you thought is going to go in a bowl. And God says fire is going to try it. And whatever is of hay, wooden stubble, what happens to it? It burns. It won't be eternal. But the rest of it will be eternal. You hope. I hope. I'm hoping that some of whatever burns down, will God will say, well, that's a great offering. Lay it at my feet. 
But it's all going to be judged. It's all going to be put in a bowl. So, back to truth. Hebrews 6, um, 18 says, God cannot lie. So, if that's a true statement, which I believe it is, how important is this if God can't lie? It's probably the most important book on the planet. Above everything. It's the most important book. The other thing is, we have been given, uh, 2 Peter um, 1.15, I think, says we have been given exceedingly great and precious promises that by those promises we can be, what? Partakers of the image of Christ. That's why I said earlier, I'm not a sinner. <laughs> I'm a sinner, but I'm not a sinner. I know that's contradictory. God doesn't see me as a sinner. I'm still working my way out of not doing sin anymore. But He's already said, He's given us every promise that will keep us to making the right choices. Because if you make the right choices and you're in His Spirit, He's molding and shaping and rearranging you into the image of Jesus. See, these are truths from God's Word. I know I don't have a lot of time, but... Trusting in God's Word for the direction of your life. Psalms 3.5. Uh, anybody want to quote it? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not on your own understanding. So... That's the premise. That, to me, that's the foundational stone to why you believe God's Word. Because as you make that statement of faith, if you quote that verse, what you're saying to yourself is, I can trust in God's Word to guide my life. I can trust in God's Spirit through His Word to give me direction, give me clarity and when, I'm, when it's darkness. To give me direction when I don't know which way to go. To give me peace when everything else is falling around me. That's the foundational stone. We've already just said in Hebrews, God can't lie. Now, I've, I said it a minute ago, you know, there's, there's, there's that prosperity teaching in America that, you know, God wants you healthy, wealthy, wise. Well, I don't know about that. I know that He's got promises evermore. He's got, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I've heard all the scripture, but He never sent me a Rolls Royce. One, I didn't want one, but you understand what I'm saying? We can, we can twist all of what that nonsense is because if God gave you everything you wanted, would you want Him? I promise you in your flesh you would not. If He gave you the big yacht and gave you the big bank account and gave you all the, the good looks and made you a movie star, you would fall so far from Him because the ways of the world don't keep you in the hands of God. They drive you on that broad road away from Him. So that's, again, when you hear that kind of teaching, that thinking, that's when you have to base it on God's Word. Lord, is this what your Word says? Then you'll know whether it's truth. And then Proverbs 37.5 says, Commit your ways to the Lord. Whatever you do, day in and day out, if He is truth and His Word is truth, now this is a, I'm going to put you to the test, Lord. God doesn't mad. He, he doesn't mind doing that. I did it 40 years ago. Jesus, if you're real, I'll give you my life for seven days. If you can't change me, you take the high road, I'll take the low road, and we'll never see each other again. <laughs> I said it. I didn't know it any other way. Dead serious, clear as a day, I said it to the King of Kings. I, I wasn't proud. I was broken in my brokenness. I was hurting. I, Jesus, if you're real. There wasn't any, ah, if you're real. It was like, Lord, I'm broken. And, I, and you know what's happened. 40 years. I've been trying to love Him and serve Him and be faithful to who He is. Okay, now the life. This is the good part and we'll close. Jesus said in 10, John 10.10 10, that He's come to give us what? Life. But what kind of life? Abundant life. Now, that sounds contradictory that He doesn't want you to have everything, but He does want you to have everything. He wants to bring life to you like you've never known. The funny part about my life, which is rather odd, I realized that when I, was, when, I came, when I came to Christ at 17, when I hit 34 years, I was 50% of my life away from sin, most of it. When I hit later years, now, now I'm 100% away from sin. Meaning that sin and shame that was when I, my first 17 years wasn't part of my life anymore. So it's now easier for me to grow in the things of God because I don't have all that excess baggage. And that's what God wants to cut off. That's the abundant life that He wants for you. Now, you can drag all that with you as you go. And I know, Michael and I know plenty that came through the ministry that never gave up that stuff. 
that they struggled with it and struggled with it and struggled with it. Were they saved? That's in God's hand. That's not my call. If the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life. But you can struggle your whole life with the baggage that you were to be freed from if you don't let it go. I want to let it go. I hope you do too. So Jesus says in John 10.10, the thief, as we quoted earlier, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. So he's no friend. You know that. I don't care how much he whispers to you that you're the best thing since sliced bread or how good he makes life good for you. But what I was going to say was, for the first 50% of my Christian life, this is unbelievable, I had not one problem. I could pray. Money would be in a meter to park my car. I, I would see God do miraculous, and then one day he said, Son, I'm going to have you grow up. <laughs> I don't know if you started out that way, but I came into this walk of faith where you could ask God for anything, and he did it and did it and did it and did it. And one day he said, Enough's enough, son. You're going to trust me for who I am? And, and, then, it was, and then I went into health issues and so forth. But, but all of his assurance from those first 22 years or 18 years gave me an assurance that when the latter 22, well, it's almost 20 years now, I've been in harm's way for almost 18, 14 years in the first liver, and now five on this latter one, so that's 19 years. So, you know, it could fail tomorrow. But it, to me, it doesn't matter. Because I know I'm not going to live here forever. I'm going to be in the presence of the king, hopefully with, with crowns able to throw at his feet, and he say, well done, good and faithful servant. So I, I got most of this figured out, but it's the day-to-day -day part that I don't. It's how do I choose to stay righteous? How do I make decisions that please the Lord? How do I keep my mind out of the gutter? How do I make decisions that aren't deceptive? And those are the battles you fight on a day-to-day -day basis. But if Jesus says, I've come to give you abundant life, you have abundant life. You just have to exercise it. Now, that's not that mystical stuff. Let me show you how. Life from the dead. He says in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. That's the foundational point by which we have life. If there was no resurrection, we would have no life. So that's the foundational point you have to remember day to day. I am the resurrection and the life. For me, I'm not real bright. I have to constantly remember all that he did for me to keep me on the straight and narrow because I can get off just like the next guy. I can go wayward. I don't want to, but I have to remember that if he promised that he's the life and proved it through the resurrection, I want that life in me. He says, life everlasting, Romans 20, uh, 5, 21. Grace reigns, through, grace reigns eternal through Jesus. The reason that grace or unmerited favor reigns eternal, it'll never cease, is because the God who rose from the dead will never cease. See, that's the life we have in something that will never, or someone that will never, ever go away. All of the others, and I won't quote them, but all of the other religions that you have heard about or maybe read through in your earlier years, or you're still fighting with them now, they're going to cease at some point. The God that rose from the dead, He won't cease. He will forever be into eternity. He really is eternity. He's eternal, He said, and I think that He's eternity. It's a part of who He is. He's the God of eternity. Okay. Death, uh, death is abolished. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.10 1, Death was abolished by Jesus. Okay. I, I had a lot of scriptures and I didn't want to get through all of them because we didn't really have the time. But believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now it comes to this question. How shall we live? That ought to be your everyday question from now on in your life. Now, I probably won't see you again until probably May when we come back. And I hope that some of you will say, well, I chose to make the right decision every day from this point forward. And I can see God working in me and working in my character, working in my job, working in my life, doing things that I never thought He could do. But if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, how shall we live? Salvation first coming to Christ and then the other one is term you I know you hear here but we don't hear much in the states obedience in the Old Testament obedience is better than sacrifice <laughs> we can give money we can give time but if you're not obedient in your heart and your character and your behavior of life it's a null and void to God because 
Obedience is what his son did for us on Calvary. And if we're, if we're growing into the image of Christ, he wants us to be obedient on a day-to-day -day basis. This is by where we get our marching orders from to be obedient for, is by the word of God. And, and just having it in your car and just having it on your desk or whatever is not going to make you obedient. Reading it and applying it. Okay. Um, speaking wholesome words again is something that would be obedient. Laying aside the sins of the flesh. Putting on a Christian character. Holy ambition is what Colossians 3, 21, uh, excuse me, Colossians uh, 3, 21 through 31. Is the Christian character is what I want to leave you with. I think the world's very confused about what a Christian is today. At least we are in America. Because they think that you can live wayward, you can live out of whack, but as long as you go to church, you're okay. Well, I don't know about you. I think I sense a lot about this church. That's not what you want here. I, I think you want to do and be the things of God in Hong Kong and wherever your world takes you back to the Philippines or wherever, Australia. I've met some people here from Australia. Wherever your home base is, wherever you live day to day, that ought to be a reflection in that area of who you are in Christ, what you are in Christ, how your life is lived in Christ day to day. They ought to see something in you that says, they're different. And I hope it will come out where they're godly, their character is such that, it, that they don't allow sin in on a regular basis. I'm going to fall. I'm going to try not to. But when I do, John gives me, God has given us a, an opportunity to get out of it. But we don't have a license to stay in it. That's what the Holy Spirit convicts us of is stop it. Stop doing it. Start doing, stop doing this, start doing that. So I want us to pray. And if any of you are unsure if you were to die today would you go to heaven and why would God say come on in there's only one simple answer and if the answer is not this God I believe that you sent Jesus to give me life that through his death on the cross that paid for my sin that kept me away from you and his resurrection provided eternal life to all that ask Him into their heart. The blood covers you. God says, I will give you eternal life. That's the only answer. There's not, you know the old adage, well, I did good. I helped the lady across the street. I didn't kick a dog. or None of that stuff. None of that will work. There's only one answer according to the Scriptures. So if that's what you have not done, but I know the pastors will be up here to pray with you to receive Christ as your Savior. But if you're born again and you know that I like what that guy said, he's a little goofy, but I do like what he says, then here's what I want to pray for. That you will make a commitment to say, Jesus, I want you as the Lord of my life for the rest of my natural life. I want to know you. I want to live in you. I want to be broken by you. That sounds odd, but I'm truly a broken man and I'm better for it. I see the areas that he's worked in and changed and molded and shaped. He made me a father that I, I didn't have a father. I had one, but I didn't have one. And I said to myself, I don't want to be like those people. I've broken a bond of alcoholism. I've broken a bond of drug addictions. All of my kids married as virgins. They never tried alcohol. They never did drugs. They don't swear. Not that any of that matters, but they saw their dad. I said, if I do, if I do it, they're going to do it. Because I grew up in a home that says, don't do what I do, do what I say. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So I'm telling you and asking you today that I know these pastors, they love the Lord, their characters are such that they are here and they want to grow here and here by each and every day of their lives. They will be a model for you that they love Jesus and I hope you would emulate them. But the prayer today is if you want that for your life, if you want to pursue the things of God that are so exciting, I could tell you stories until the cows come home of what He has done miraculously and physically and spiritually and financially in my life. And I've been the worst of the worst. I promise you, you've got great days ahead of you if you will give your life to Christ from this day forward. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' precious name, we thank you for you today. And Lord, we thank you for...